it's delightful to have you here in Worcester and to listen to all your insights about German geography and especially this recent study of yours in Friuli. I still treasure the souvenir of going to München over a year ago mm -hmm. to visit a mutual friend of ours, Professor Wolfgang Hartke, uh, still one of the people I admire most in the history of geographic thought. I would like you to tell us a little bit about what it was like to be a student of Professor Hartke. Tell us a little more about your own background, and then we'll go on to talk about your recent work. Yes, but I should first mention that we didn't meet first in Munich, but in Liverpool, and you mightn't have even noticed it, because I was on an audience waiting for a, a lecture to be given by Professor Anne Batima, and everybody was waiting for an elderly lady with, with spectacles, and there was a <laughs> young student cleaning the blackboard, and. Uh, we thought, oh, they have quite nice students here, and then suddenly the student turned around and gave the lecture. <laughs> this was my first meeting with you. Oh, it was a delightful meeting. Oh, yes, it was. Uh, but speaking of Hartke and of Munich, of course it's a long way back to the roots of German social geography, and Hartke and Bobek really are the leading men in this field. Um, when I was leaving Czechoslovakia in after the first the second world war 1946 as a boy of 16 I came to Frankfurt and I finished college and then studied geography at the department of geography at the university and Hartke fascinated me from the first day because I had a totally different opinion what geography was and maybe Geography in Frankfurt was something special in these years because Horkheimer and Adorno, the two leading social, uh, sociologists who had to leave Germany during the Hitler period, had just returned. The year being now. And uh, this was about 1949, uh -huh. the first to come back and to re-establish the Frankfurt School of Sociology. And Hartke was just too eager to bring his students in connection with sociology. So um, I studied sociology too, and I found this was the right thing to do in this situation in West Germany. Especially since all other geography was more or less physical geography. Yes. And this too had its reason in the Second World War. Yes, yes, there was a predominance of, of geomorphology and physical geography. Even in our references to German uh, thought, we refer to the biological and the physical side of geography rather than the human, for a variety of reasons, of course. There are some reasons. One of them is that human geography had to pay lip service to the Third Reich, and therefore some of the elder geographers who might be going back to office um, were not acceptable anymore. Maybe with the exception of Kristaller, but in fact, though he is the most famous geographer after the Second World War for American and English readers in geography, uh, it's, he was always a non-person. He never got tenure. Why was that? Was it a classic syndrome of the prophet unacceptable in his own land, or were there evidently other reasons? So, evidently so. Uh, the first reason may have been that Kristalla uh, might have been too far away from the normal way of thought of German geography, which was concentrating on landscape studies and on foreign affairs, all the capes and bays and <laughs> geography as a kind of inventory of the earth. And he tried to find out about the rules. But Hartke was one of the first ones to uh, give Kristalla a chance. In fact, the Frankfurt journals, uh, which he edited, brought the first uh, papers from Kristalla uh -huh. after the big book on the Central Place Studies. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, I think Torsten tells about it, finding Kristalla alone mm -hmm. in Germany and not very much appreciated by his colleagues there. But what was it like to study under Hartke at, at Frankfurt? Or was it later that you had most of your work with him? Or was it in the Frankfurt years you... you in first? the Frankfurt years, I would say I, ra I met him rather lately. Mm -hmm. I first studied German literature 
and ethnology and sociology and it's been only in my second or third year that I got really interested in geography because of Hartke and then I rather fast uh, made my uh, PhD under his uh, guidance and it's always it always had to do studies which he influenced had always to do with groups and landscape because it had been a long way uh, to introduce sociology in German geography mm -hmm. and this had to be by means of talking about landscape it had more or less to camouflage his uh, specific yeah. interest in uh, society and he had to approach to uh, his geographical colleagues to be acknowledged in the in the profession, profession by uh, showing that he was a physical geographer too how, yes how did he demonstrate that I mean, oh he influenced some studies on uh, soil erosion mm -hmm. but always interested in the fact that the human factors were at least as important as the climatic factors yes and even Bobek, his friend and his counterpart, Vienna, Frankfurt, and later on Munich, uh, did some work on climatology. Yes, yes, he explained something of the of the professional uh, influences on that choice. Mm. But I think in Hartke's case, there was a real concern about social problems, the Hutekinder, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, to find a connection between it and the physical environment was difficult. In fact. Yeah. Uh, the physical environment was a kind of mirror where social processes depicted themselves. Uh -huh. And to convince the other geographers, all those in office, uh -huh. that it would be worthwhile looking at these social issues, uh, this gave the drive and this uh, influenced students to come and to uh, listen to Hartke and to build up a kind of school around him. Uh -huh. Uh -huh the Frankfurt Munich School of Social Geography, so to say. And were you considered uh, a part of the fabric of German geography, or were you considered somewhat uh, young Turks moving in a new direction by your colleagues in Germany? Not in this case, because we did, uh, would say, regular work with some input of new ideas, and the, break the breakthrough for Hatke came but in the early 60s, not in 1952 when I made my PhD uh -huh. with him. Mm -hmm. yes. So, in fact, it was school and uh, the educational uh, side of the whole geographical business which brought uh, Hartke's school of thought uh, to the fore. Because evidently schools needed a new form of geography. That's high school. High school geography, uh -huh. graduate, uh, graduate schools, and, and uh, no, it's colleges. It's on the level of, of senior, senior high school, if you compare it to mm -hmm. America. And there was a demand for these new thoughts because uh, geography would have been extinct from the curriculum of subjects uh -huh. if it wouldn't have taken the move to social geography. I see. That's very interesting. In an earlier generation, I think McKinder did a similar thing with the British schools. Mm -hmm. And I think Davis and some of the others were influential in America. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> I didn't know that about, about Hartke. So school. his school suddenly was in high demand. Uh -huh. And um, all school books were rewritten uh -huh. after the experiences of uh, social geography. Uh -huh. But one thing he gave you was complete legitimacy for applied work, being interested in human problems set in a geographic context. And uh, the thing that has fascinated me about our conversation during this visit is your account of the Friuli study, uh, the earthquake in Friuli. Mm -hmm. And I would like if you would give us a fairly good description of that now. Uh, how did you get interested in it, and how did you approach it, and how do you evaluate the whole... I would say now. the first motivation was a quite personal one. Mm -hmm. I had uh, an appointment with Peter Haggett in Bristol on the 7th of May 1976. And on going to Bristol by bus, I heard in the radio there's been a large earthquake south of Munich. And so it took me some pounds to telephone back home 
but to learn that this has been about 200 kilometers southeast of, southeast of Munich. And talking to my wife and learning that my family was still sound and, and happy, and I th suddenly thought, why not your own family in distress? And so I talked some things over with Peter Hackett, and uh, I thought I should go into this Friuli business. Friuli business, it's a hard word to say. <laughs> but in fact, uh, the very special thing with the Friuli earthquake is that it happened twice, once on the 2nd of, on the 6th of May, and the second on the 15th of September. And again, on maybe the 17th of September, I had another motivation because I visited Gilbert White in Boulder, Colorado, and we talked about problems like this, and he said to me, when you go over, just have a look at this. And what was supposed to be just a look became a kind of obsession. Because this really seemed to me to be a, a duty for geographers to do, and that applied geography, which we had been taught by Hartke, could maybe show some of its capacity in a serious situation like yes. this. Do you think Gilbert White influenced you very much? Oh, very much, because I was on a trip from Vancouver to uh, the southern part of California, maybe San Diego, and back following the San Andreas Fault uh -huh. and learning something about uh, expected earthquakes, their impact on social systems, and following the issue of reconstruction following a disaster. Yes. And <coughs> so it was, I would say, some input of American thinking and some motivation by the Hutke School, mm -hmm. which finally brought me in December 1976, when I had returned from a sabbatical in the United mm -hmm. States and Canada, to go to Friuli for the first time in my life and mm -hmm. to see this destroyed country. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, tell me then how you approached it. Now, one thing was that uh, evidently everybody thought this is sunny Italy. Yes. And that, in fact, it was a quite mountainous area with a lot of snow, mm -hmm. and that all the barracks and prefabs, 28,000 of them to house 86,000 mm -hmm. uh, homeless people, mm -hmm. were put up in sheds without stoves. And so there was a kind of approach to German donors to collect money to buy stoves, mm -hmm. and a uh, Red Cross truck brought about 200 iron stoves to a uh, fuel mm -hmm. and I just sat beside the driver and we did this way through more or less destroyed roads mm -hmm. to go to the area. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we could have a slide that will show us the location of, mm -hmm. the, of the actual impact. I think this would be yes. a good idea. Mm -hmm. Because it's a very interesting area. It's an interesting area and it might not be yeah. self-explanatory if no. you uh -huh. didn't have a map for it. Yes. And it's always maps with which geographers are trying to convince people. Sure. Might as well display our wares, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it, I was in Sweden during when that news came. Mm -hmm. There was a Yugoslav student with me. Yes, here we go. Now this shows the destroyed area. It's a three countries corner wedged in between the northeastern part of Italy, Austria and Yugoslavia. And you might see the north of the Adriatic and that's been the mountainous part. If we look at the next slide we would see that uh, it's a quite mountainous area and that the uh, alluvial fan of the Dalliamento River mm -hmm. is most prominent in this picture. Uh, the division line between earthquake-struck country and the country which was not touched is about in the middle of this alluvial fan of the Tagliamento River mm -hmm. and the core of the earthquake was just the place where the Tagliamento River leaves in a canyon, in a canyon which is very uh, romantic, mm -hmm. but not in this situation. And the Tagliamento River, I suppose, is a river quite known to the Anglophone world because it's 
may be more or less a character in uh, Hemingway's mm -hmm. two big war novels, yes. which play in this area, which has a lot of. I think there's a there's a slide on on the Taliamento River where it just leaves the mountain and goes down to the Adriatic Sea. Mm -hmm. Now it's been this area, which was uh, earthquake struck. 4,800 kilometers, square kilometers of it, with about 1,000 dead, about 2,500 wounded, and 86,000 homeless. Now, there would be a long story to tell how all this went on. I think it would be best to tell it by just uh, showing some pictures yes. and commenting on them. So, if we could have the next, I would try to find out what it is. Now this is the uh, intensity, intensity of, the, of mm. the destruction and you see that it's in the poorest area, in the mountainous area, and that this seismic map just shows that the very core of the earthquake was just at the, at the place where Bend. the Taliamento leaves the mountains. Yes. And this area has always been a an area of emigration for 200 years at least <coughs> and people went to all parts of the world. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine who teaches at Simon Fraser, Phil Wagner, who accompanied me to this area and did some of the translation of our mm -hmm. book, uh, told me that Vancouverites, students of his own department who were Friulian, were in telephone contact with this area uh -huh. during and after the earthquake and the Friulians are a very, very nice group of hard-working Italians, not, uh, meet, met, not matching the normal picture which you might have of uh, happy-go-lucky people. Yes. And they are really very hard-working, which I have all reasons to respect, especially for their work of reconstruction. Yes. Mm -hmm. But there were two impacts, yes? There was two impacts. Just one? We could uh, look maybe for the next slides. It's a little bit topsy-turvy, but it doesn't matter because the yellow uh, uh, points are the first earthquake which was closer to the surface and though it was only at 6.5 Richter, it had a lot of destruction and the latter one, the red dots, mm -hmm. are the, the earthquake of the 15th of September, mm -hmm. which was a little bit more to the north mm -hmm. and which struck terror on the population because they just had started to they reconstruct and yes. they lost everything mm. again. Next one. Mm. Yes, that, that must have been really devastating. Was there a difference, did you find, in the motivation to reconstruct after the second one than there was after the first? Or was I would say thing? just the opinion leaders, those mm. who were the, the innovators, mm -hmm. who had already started to reconstruct, lost mm -hmm. all their savings. They bought material, they bought a new window panes or uh, tried to build with bricks and re uh, improve the construction mm. of their houses and then the second earthquake struck and all was in vain. Yes, I think you have some pictures yes, also I, of that. Yes, I think we can show yes. first maybe the area of highest destruction following the delineation of the Italian authorities, which is quite an interesting problem to speak of. The darkest red is the area which is totally destroyed, which has about 45 communes. And it was one of our first tasks as applied geographers mm -hmm. to look if this uh, delineation of the area was justified. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the next slide, we might see that it's a perception problem in all these things because uh, the area was seen by the decision makers who came from the southern uh, yes. cities of Udine or Portinone. And if we made a, a specific assessment of which communes had been destroyed most, not by physical, mm -hmm. but by social indicators like quota of refugees to the coastal towns about which we have to speak later on, or quota of, of uh, homeless or quota of dead and wounded, mm -hmm. there had been a core area and this core area was surrounded by a broad uh, band of lighter 
colors. Mm -hmm. And um, if we take the next slide, this was my suggestion to the Italian authorities to add some communities which ne merely had been forgotten. Mm -hmm. So the closer disaster, the closer misery was exaggerated uh -huh. on the cost of those mountain population uh -huh. who had been neglected. And this had some importance because of compensation given mm -hmm. to them. If they were included in the area of highest destruction, uh -huh. they would get a, uh, an earlier access to okay. funds and yes. a higher amount of money. Uh -huh. That was an important political exercise then, to make the map of the actual Yes, casualties. and uh, we made a survey uh, among the population and we had about 18,000 uh, questionnaires turned out and 6,500 6, came back, which was a lot of That's a paper to turn. process through yes. the data processing. And we had the impression that uh, the population was just glad that somebody cared for them from outside. Uh -huh. They got so the impression they, they could do something. Maybe they didn't trust their own government. That's a strong drive to autonomy about which we mm -hmm. might speak later on. And this three countries corner um, had already the experiences of th some autonomous provinces in Italy like the South Tyrol or yes. like the Aosta Valley. Mm -hmm. And so this uh, earthquake, the whole catastrophe uh, brought people to think of what can we do ourselves uh -huh. and not wait for the central government in Rome. Uh -huh. Yes, that's interesting. I think there a should physical be catalyst. Some yes, this will show some of the destruction. Some of the destruction. Visually. This is the city of Gemona, a city of about uh -huh. 13,000 inhabitants, and you see a palm tree and these steep mountains. That's just where Mediterranean and alpine characters meet and really the people of Friuli which I like is a mix of both. Mm -hmm. They have the charm of the Italians but they have the hard working way of mountain people. Mm -hmm. And this is a city but the next slide would show one of the lost uh, villages and one of the small farms in the mountains and they will be neglected after this. It's an area where most of the younger population has emigrated to parts of Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, France, mm -hmm. foreign labor, and all these buildings never will be reconstructed. So it's a totally uh, point zero situation for the whole landscape and for the whole settlement pattern. Oh. Mm -hmm. Now, after these pictures of destructions, we should think about the people what they did. I think there's some more. Uh, some of the uh, hazards which could be observed uh, could be expressed by this picture. This is a small village of Portis, north of Venzone, which is one of the jewels of, of Renaissance and medieval architecture. Mm -hmm. And you can see the rockfall area. Mm -hmm. So this small village is just wedged in between the Tagliamento River which is a torrent and mm. sometimes given to flooding and the rockfall area and so three hazards could be observed simultaneously, simultaneously. <coughs> and it was the rockfalls which were most prominent in the second earthquake and mm -hmm. which of course brought terror to the populations the, the roads were locked they couldn't move out and so mm. it's been a problem how they should uh, stay here or move away. Mm -hmm. And I think the next pictures are on what they experienced when they moved away. Two old, an old couple from one of the mountain villages. In, it's a nice setting, mm -hmm. but you should think that these hotels on the Adriatic coast built mm -hmm. for a leisure class society are totally empty in winter and they are not heatable. They are just for two months of, of summer, summer. Mm -hmm. and so they stayed in these hotels and they might have had a kind of cultural shock. Mm -hmm. It's mostly been the old ones and the children, while the population in the uh, uh, earthquake struck area had to go to reconstruction. Uh -huh. So it's been 28,000 who stayed on the coast waiting for the houses to be reconstructed mm -hmm. and of course they didn't return to the houses they returned to prefabs to uh -huh. barracks yes. i think there's something on it yeah. what it looked like and you can see that the stove pipes 
yes. had to be put in later because everybody thought of Summer. La Bella Italia <laughs> yes. and not that it's been an area mm. of uh, one meter of snow precipitation mm -hmm. in winter. Mm -hmm. Well, who rushed to the aid of the situation? Oh, it was the just change. a situation when many European countries uh, cooperated, including Yugoslavs, including even Soviet Russia. Mm -hmm. And um, it has been a kind of test experience because Europe is, happily enough, very rarely touched by real big catastrophes. And it's been part of Red Cross and, and uh, uh, military engineers mm -hmm. coming in and rescuing uh, mm -hmm. the population from the ruins because this, this has been a very, very old uh, area. Most of the structures were four or five hundred years old. Uh -huh. And especially the inner core of the city was mostly occupied by elderly people. Mm -hmm. So the older people lived in the older houses, in the older parts of the city. Mm -hmm. And when they collapsed, it really was very bad to them. And so uh, some of the cities had reconstruction problems because they just put out all the rubble mm -hmm. and all the debris. And now they have to find the stones which are of a cultural value. They might be, date back to 1200. and they are looking into the deposits of the debris uh -huh. to find out treasures to bring back to the cities and to re-establish them in the new buildings. Well, did the policy... Uh, now, I presume that the people who came from abroad had a certain set of agenda, priority items, and the people at home, that is, either the central government or the local emerging political, had different priorities. Could you, could you compare what the international Red Cross-type aid had in mind mm -hmm. and what the local would have preferred. Um, you are right in speaking of a kind of triangle of decision making. Yeah. The central government of course wanted to show its effectivity mm -hmm. and wanted to do away with this homeless problem by building as much houses as possible now. Yeah. The planning authorities thought that this should lead to a new settlement pattern. Mm -hmm. All those small communities in the mountains should be given up. Uh -huh. The local authorities, um, which were set to defend their autonomy, mm -hmm. were interested that all should be as it was. Uh -huh. And the international aid given was given more or less in favor of the population. So if the Italian central government denied one settlement to be rebuilt, there could be a group collecting money in Austria, in Switzerland, in Germany and donating it to the population uh -huh. uh, so that even remote mountain villages were reconstructed uh -huh. maybe even against the intentions of the central the government, government but surely to the intentions of the local government uh -huh. which was put out of office by an emergency commissioner which was, who was sent from Rome, he was a secretary of state a very, very capable man, uh -huh. and when he took over the whole business, it was like a kind of war, and emergency commissioner, in spite of the prime minister of this area, and this of course brought tensions, and we might talk about these yes, later. Yes, indeed. I, I'm very concerned about the impact of the international uh, money givers in mm. this balance between the two. Obviously, they were inclined to favor the local area, political autonomy, uh, but was that perceived as too much of a threat by Rome and therefore a strong hand came in to steer not things? That, not that. No? I think that there had been uh, sometimes tensions between the hesitating central government and the people of the area which wanted to have things done now. Mm -hmm. And you could even find uh, inscriptions on the wall, we want a German government. Uh -huh. And that in an area where there had been just a lot of hostility during the Second World War and partisan war. So when I came down, I felt a wave of, of sympathy and this aided us a good mm. deal because you really had the feeling that these people were waiting for someone from outside mm. to uh, not only rely on the central government.
-hmm. There are some We're problems smart, connected with it, and yes. we could go could on. See the next picture, mm -hmm. perhaps, yeah. Now, this yeah. is one of these barrack towns, Baracopolis, as, <coughs> as the Italians yeah. call it. It's a settlement consisting maybe of about 300 barracks of different quality, different type. Yeah. These were the prefab. The prefabs. Uh, the prefabs yeah. are uh, cities, so mm. that there was a destroyed city, a tent city, mm -hmm. a prefab city, and hopefully a city uh, which is reconstructed, reconstructed so city. that the population had to move four or five times, yes. especially those who had to go to the Adriatic coast and to the mm -hmm. hotels mm -hmm. during the winter. Mm -hmm. I think there are some Most types of prefabs, and we could talk about international aid and international problems if we see yes. them. Surely there must have been some impact mm -hmm. of standards here. Uh, this is okay. a special map, and you see that uh, some of these types are united in kind of courts, mm -hmm. the R1 area. Mm -hmm. And these small courts were supposed to be the former neighborhoods in the destroyed city, so that people could discuss problems, how shall we reconstruct? Mm -hmm. Because the former cities had been built for large families, mm -hmm. with eight children and mm -hmm. with servants, and now it was much too much space. and. Mm -hmm. um, there had to be discussed if not uh, families should move together, put together their funds and build houses, uh, maybe with the modern ways of dividing uh, floors or mm -hmm. dividing uh, one entrance from this side, one entrance from that side. And they formed small cooperatives uh -huh. so that it really could be discussed, not built just by a big architect or by a big developer. They are fighting for mm -hmm. each cornerstone and each uh, uh -huh. room in their so houses that, now. So how many of the people got a chance to be involved in designing their new home? Would you say what percent of the total population? I would say is? the court speakers, though maybe 20 of them, formed a bigger uh, body of decision making. Mm -hmm. talking to the architect, mm -hmm. uh, talking to the mayor. He got the funds. Mm -hmm. He had to spend them individually to the mm -hmm. families. But if this was done in a sensible way, so the houses could be reconstructed, taking into account the new social situation of the family, mm -hmm. the smaller family. It could take into account that the funds were uh, given uh, in a long, long period, and those who built first right. had the lower prices mm -hmm. and didn't have the inflation rate. Mm -hmm. So he who has to wait longest loses half of uh, the compensation money he gets. And usually he has been the poorest to he begin with. He has been with, the poorest yes. to begin with, without yes. information, without mm -hmm. contacts. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. we should come to this later. Yes. There are some slides showing the international aid given. Yes. See, the United States was predominant Large. and uh, Switzerland, okay. Germany, Austria. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even Saudi Arabia, yes. with all its big income from yes. oil, did a lot. Mm. And all these uh, neighboring countries centered on the reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Some of them uh, sent uh, just funds, yes. others sent houses. Mm -hmm and some houses were ordered <coughs> by the central government. I think there's mm. a good example of a container which yeah. is being pulled up into a mountain village. That's just a normal container with four windows and yes. one door. And it was ordered by the central government because these containers could be stacked uh -huh. and put aside as a kind of strategic reserve if there should be a disaster somewhere else. But of course this uh, cabins, these containers were not the right type of building for a mountain area. And on the next slide, you would see them side by side. On the left side, it's mm -hmm. easy, easy to be seen so clearly, there are wooden houses, wooden cabins of a quite good type, and then the other side, that's just these containers. Mm -hmm. And to see them side by side means that a new social uh, tension developed in these new communities uh -huh. 
uh, by chance one got a good house, another one got a bad cabin, just mm -hmm. covered with a layer of of uh, plastic. Mm -hmm. And if the snow in winter would pile up, it might even collapse. Uh -huh. So it was hard luck to get a building like this. And the government had given it, and there was another building, and this was given by Austrian or German or Yugoslavian aid, and this was mm -hmm. a better one. And so you could think of all the social tensions, the group right. building around such an issue. Mm -hmm. Why did the central government decide on that particular model? Did it import from a particular construction company? It's abroad? been a Canadian uh, company and they supplied it just because it was a type which was handy, easy to transport, easy mm -hmm. to stack and easy to keep in mm -hmm. store for mm -hmm. further events. So it's been the government deciding for the population and yes. not the population deciding which type of house to have for themselves. Itself. Yes, well, that's very interesting. So you actually watched a new social order emerge, in fact. Mm. How successful were the local interests in shaping the course of reconstruction? Uh, I would say that in some communes it went quite well. Mm -hmm. They had uh, people very much motivated to work for their communes. Mm -hmm. They had gifted architects who could talk to the population to see what they really needed mm -hmm. and who were willing to reconstruct, to make freely one of the cultural treasures of, of medieval architecture, not just another suburb of Milan. So wow. they needed to keep their cultural identity. Mm -hmm. And the picture we just saw might give a small hint to what these people had to go through. You can read Portis de Verinashere Qui. Portis will be reconstructed here. here. And this Qui, this here, has been chipped away by a rock fall. And the rock is still on the left side of the road, which the road was totally closed after the second mm -hmm. earthquake. The people mm -hmm. couldn't move out. And so they decided, we will reconstruct here. Mm -hmm. But because of the rockfall area, it was much too dangerous. And though the central government decided the uh, community should be moved, and then it isn't readable, but maybe with an inset, we mm -hmm. could try to find out a bit about it. There's another poster, mm -hmm. and this is Puartis uh, Stoe Rinachere Qui. And this now is in Friulian. Uh -huh. So if the central government decided to do away with the village here, the people decided we should stay, and they now did not put it up in Italian, they now put it up in Frulans, <laughs> Furlans, which is a beautiful language, uh -huh. spoken by about 400,000 of them. That's very interesting. But in the reconstruction, is there any tension between the economic or material uh, side and the architectural, aesthetic, historic side? In other words, I could imagine that mm. many of the, of the motivations to keep preserve the treasure of medieval architecture would conflict with some fairly fundamental uh, agenda on the economic front. Now, first it would be cheaper to build in wood. And yes. most of Scandinavia, as you know from your yes. Swedish experiences, is built in wood. All California is built in wood. Most of the houses here in the Booster area in the older parts are built of wood. And wood is a beautiful material, but the Italians take pride in having a house of stone. Uh -huh. And this was so dangerous because they mostly took the cobblestones out of the riverbeds. Uh -huh. They are rounded, uh -huh. rounded boulders and they wouldn't, wouldn't stay in sight uh -huh. when the earth shakes. Now there could be a kind of education in the direction of building with wood. Uh -huh. And our questionnaire held this question. Are you going to build your house, your future house in stone and bricks or in wood? and it's been only 16% uh, who wanted to rebuild in wood. Mm. It might have been cheaper, but they wanted houses they were used to. Mm -hmm. The second problem is that these houses, of course, could be built with all the new methods of prefab parts mm -hmm. put into uh, site by a big crane, and then indeed it would be just freely another uh, suburb so of right. Milan. Mm -hmm. And there were some people, especially one architect, Birzio Piroli, who had the idea that the Friuli uh, population 
could really have a kind of renaissance of its cultural identity if people expecting to come home from abroad re-emigrating mm -hmm. to this part of the uh, land shouldn't be uh, just taken aback by the development of houses mm -hmm. uh, which they could have everywhere. Yes. So it became a kind of issue how to reconstruct mm -hmm. quick, cheap and without destroying the cultural identity. Is that an impossible agenda? That's a <laughs> more or less impossible agenda. Yeah. But some of the architects really succeeded in mm -hmm. doing. I think there will be a picture some later mm -hmm. time to show how they did it. Mm -hmm. Now, part of this uh, tension between the central government and the local interest mm -hmm. on reconstruction uh, shows up when you look at the elections. Mm -hmm. They took place just between the 6th of May earthquake and the 15th of September earthquake. <laughs> so all parties were just too eager to proclaim that they would be the best to elect for the renaissance of the country. And it was an autonomist party, uh, Partita Friulana, which wanted to um, broaden the basis of of autonomy and mm -hmm. you can see that the delineation of the of the area of destruction and the uh, delineation where this party had the highest successes during the elections. This is the autonomous meet. party. That's the autonomous uh -huh. party. I see. Mm -hmm. So they are, actually it, it brought about a new political creation as well as, as landscape. As well, yeah. and a strong drive towards an old an own cultural centre. Yes. They demanded a university of Udine. Uh -huh. The province of uh, Friuli, Venezia Giulia is ruled from Trieste, mm. which is a port town and which has totally different ideas and totally different economic aims than mm -hmm. this mountain and hillside population. Mm -hmm. And one of the interests of the population is to get an own university. Yes. And this should, of course, concentrate on local problems like an architecture faculty which could learn from the experiences, maybe mm. could be leading in seismic safety mm -hmm. construction. Then on agriculture, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of new developments now mm -hmm. since uh, parts of the m remoter valleys mm -hmm. have to be given up. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see you have an architectural sketch also. Of that's exactly what I uh -huh. was supposed to, to mm -hmm. show as an example how you can build by way of module elements, prefab mm -hmm. prefabricated ones, cheap ones, mm -hmm. without losing the uh, character. normal character, yeah. the character of distance, space, and mm -hmm. there's a long story to it if we can stay on this picture a little bit longer. Le uh, Corbusier once yeah. invented the module, the I think it's about three meters and sixty and one meter and eighty, and mm -hmm. it has to do with the golden rule, and it has to do with space where people uh, feel uh, content secure. and feel secure. Mm -hmm. And the module of the whole Friulian architecture rests upon seven meters. Mm -hmm. These were the longest wooden logs which could, as a raft, be transported on the Deliamento River. Uh -huh. So this seven meters set the outer uh, space, the, the yeah. kind of, of framework, and it was always a multiple of seven or half of seven, and all people seem to live in a space of this seven mm -hmm. holy this holy number mm -hmm. of seven mm -hmm. and reconstruction takes into account and now there are some uh, um, prefab factories mm -hmm. supplying building equipment which is measured to mm -hmm. these dimensions so that rescued parts of the history of a house can be re-established uh -huh. into the framework of a new one. Mm -hmm. So it's an attempt with modern means to uh, preserve identity. 
Uh huh. Uh huh. But uh, my, can I repeat a question that uh, I was trying to pose a little earlier? Is there a tension between this uh, architectural historic interest and the economic imperatives of making this again a vibrant region where people will return to? Economic development would surely demand a sort of rationalization of space and and investment, concentration of investment in a few points and so on, which would go more along the lines that the central government was applying than those uh, heralded by the local party. Has that tension appeared yet? This tension has especially appeared in the reconstruction of the factories mm -hmm. because the big ones would be the winners. Mm -hmm. Small business, small handicrafts are supposed to lose and some big factories are supposed to win. They have the better <coughs> connections in the information system. Mm -hmm. They got all uh, law advice, judicial advice mm -hmm. as to what to do first. They can exploit the laws mm -hmm. made in advance for the reconstruction of the area. And as so often it's the poor ones and the old ones who have to wait for building capacity. Uh -huh. It's not like in a normal area where you are at here a building, there a building to the normal settlement. It's building a whole area of 100 communes, once at a time, starting everywhere. And of course it starts with the factories, with the governmental buildings, with schools, which is mm -hmm. necessary, with uh, new uh, mm, banks, which are ne necessary, all the amenities mm -hmm. come first. And people has to wait for building capacity. They do a lot by themselves. They are all gifted masons, gifted mm -hmm. builders. They can do a lot by themselves. But those who have to wait longest mm -hmm. lose part of the uh, funds given to them. There's a very high uh, inflation rate in Italy about 12% per mm -hmm. year per mm -hmm. year and the prices are constantly raising so rising prices and uh, inflation eats up the uh, compensation for the poorer ones for mm -hmm. the older ones and there will be very very many who will live in these barracks for the rest of their lives. So you're saying that in fact the central government policy is having its way regardless of the apparent short-term success of the local political party and so on. Mm. And regardless of the fact that this museumification is proceeding also and so on, you're saying that there is an inevitable trend toward uh, rational economic development, in fact, cashing in on uh, the disaster. There are some the cashing in on the disaster, mm. big business, of course. Mm. And they have the capacity of doing things first. Of mm. course it is necessary that workplaces should, should be generated, mm. but some are generated with a totally new technology. Mm -hmm. So they save workplaces instead of creating new ones. Uh -huh. So the rationality of modern industry comes together with the earthquake and some of the bigger factories can lay off workers mm -hmm. just because of a new technology which they wouldn't have bought and introduced if the old machinery wasn't destroyed mm -hmm. by the uh -huh. earthquake. So it's against the poorer ones and in favor of um, the system. And so coming back to Hatke and his yes. social issues, it yes. had uh, it was one of our tasks to criticize this and mm -hmm. maybe the circumstances that this area has been under close observation in a three countries corner uh -huh. of Austria, of Switzerland, of Germany. Um, many of the things which had been uh, supposed to take place here did not happen. For example? For example, the uh, um, loss of funds because of bribery mm -hmm. or the things which happened to the uh, Belice Valley people in Sicily mm -hmm. that the Mafia got hold of part of yes. the uh, funds raised by the government. Um, there are some very small cases of blackmail which type of house to take and which not. Mm -hmm. 
but in fact uh, the uh, Italian local and I must say the emergency commissioner did an admirable uh, mm -hmm. part of work in at least supplying the population with a shelter and mm -hmm. to do away with the mm -hmm. worst uh, outcomes of the catastrophe. You've looked up the studies done on similar events. Well, no event is ultimately similar, but to other earthquake and hazardous situations. Do you think that, that there is now developing a general knowledge, <clears throat> a general lore about natural hazards, which could be relied upon if tomorrow uh, we get a hazard here off the coast of Massachusetts. Can we build on your experience or in fact are each constellation, uh, is each constellation of circumstances unique? I think each constellation is unique and in spite of that you can learn a lot of the uh, ever alike reactions of a society to such a catastrophe. But you just said the Italians behaved in a way that they weren't supposed to behave. There was no corruption. There was, there was no, no corruption. There was no bribery. Uh, Aren't there cultural differences in response? There are cultural dis differences may maybe between Sicily and Friuli. <coughs> there will be uh, cultural differences between Friuli and California if there will be a, a, an earthquake. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to expose the findings of mm -hmm. American scholars on hazards Mm. as Gilbert White's and there are some models of Gilbert White which mm -hmm. we try to improve and to fill in with material mm -hmm. which was uh, collected during these Friuli experiences. Mm -hmm. I would say there is a certain development on knowledge about hazards which is filled in by every new event. Yes. And the speciality of this event might have been that it happened in a in a area in an area with a very high developed cultural heritage yes with a uh, very high uh, capacity of people to organize themselves mm -hmm. which is not so uh, though clear mm -hmm. everywhere there are american findings on turkish earthquakes where people just waited for the authorities to act yeah, and just waited mm -hmm. and waited too long and this discussion between authority and self-government mm -hmm. has been a good experience to me because it was new to the Italians too. Mm -hmm. So the political constellation mm -hmm. in the countries may differ. Mm -hmm. Self-government might be an issue in America of a much longer experience and you would be very much adversary to an emergency commission set in from mm -hmm. Washington to settle mm -hmm. things in, in California. Mm -hmm. But maybe this could be an experience worthwhile looking into even for Americans waiting for the right. big California North. They call them by different names in mm -hmm. America. But I, I, we are running out of time, Robert. I would love if you could summarize what you think might be the lessons learned from the Friuli study. For example, in an area where the, there aren't consultants ready to tap, but that an earthquake might happen, how could a population prepare itself in a way? Is there any preparatory education, uh, preliminary planning that one can do if one lives in such an area? If one lives in such an area, uh, mostly you develop a certain way of taking things a little bit easier than others. But this population did not take things easier because they had waited for an earthquake to come for 600 years. Uh -huh. And uh, therefore, they were really overwhelmed mm. by this experience. And uh, the nation of these Friulians uh, were more or less a newborn nation after this experience. A lot of people came back. Mm -hmm. They suddenly, by all the news media, by the reports in the, in the TV all over the world, were informed about what heritage they had. Mm -hmm. Maybe they didn't know of it when they went away, but when they returned, they knew that it is a place where people have to go back to and have to mm -hmm. stay forever. And they are now uh, re-emigrating, and so a catastrophe must not be just a disaster, mm -hmm. but a new beginning. Yes. 
Yes. And this might be one of the lessons, uh, maybe not uh, transferable to other mm. parts of the world, and so then it would be unique. Mm. But I suppose if people go through such an ordeal, mm. they uh, are in some way reborn, and uh, the social scientist mm. uh, takes such a situation as a kind of laboratory, and he sometimes feels guilty that he uses these chinny pigs mm -hmm. to guinea to guinea pigs to 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 uh, that he puts human beings in such a situation. Said mm. he he uh, goes with a questionnaire in yes. a situation where he should put bricks mm. and stones on top of one mm. another, mm -hmm. and so maybe the scientist is a little bit uneasy when he looks back on such a work. He might have had more aid from the side of psychology. Yes. We should maybe have looked into the families much closer, but this had to be done by the Italian colleagues, and indeed they did some of yes. these things, and there are some studies coming out now which will show that the psychological um, experience is maybe the more important one than just our small geographical findings. Well, our small geographical searchings and findings are not indeed small when you look at the human consequences. Thank you very much for sharing this story with us. I'm sure that Professor Harkey would be proud of his former student and the marvelous, the uh, ambitious project that you took on. Thank you very much, and we look forward to future conversations. Thank you, Anne. Yeah.